Greetings students of the force and welcome to the channel. Today we put together a few of the unknown regions videos that we've produced here, explaining some of the various dark entities and powerful force wielding foes that lie beyond the known galaxy, as well as why traveling to the unknown regions was so treacherous and nearly impossible. Hopefully you guys are liking these longer compilation videos, as you can put it on in the background and cook or work or whatever have you. As always my friends, I hope you guys enjoy and remember, be weary of the unknown. Greetings again, curious acolytes of the galaxy, and welcome back to the archives. Over the course of the Jedi Order's long history, they have always championed themselves as followers of the light side exclusively. However, we are all quite aware that despite this claim, some of the most ruthless and terrifying Sith Lords have come straight out of the Jedi Order's ranks. A Jedi falling to the dark side did happen quite a bit, and when we look at the overarching timeline of the Order's history, it appeared to be a frequent occurrence, especially during during times of war. Typically, the High Council's response to this was to tighten their grip on their members and impose even more fence laws and narrow doctrine until unfortunately, the Jedi became stagnated in their own light side dogma. Many criticize the Jedi for not doing more with their own members when it comes to their temporary turn to the dark side. And while we also held that opinion for quite some time, our archaeologists have recently uncovered a secret planet known as Spinter, a planet where the Jedi Order had established a rehabilitation center for those that had fallen to the dark side, a place that the Jedi Order called the Dawn Temple. The Dawn Temple was a secluded outpost on the peaceful Outer Rim world of Spinter. The Dawn Temple served as a way for those Jedi that were tempted by the dark side to seek redemption and peace. But these seemingly forgiving halls hide a very dark secret, one that may very well be one of the Jedi Order's most astonishing crimes. So today my friends, sit with us as we open up yet another holocron and talk about the mysteries of the Dawn Temple. First, let's begin with the world of Spinter. The planet Spinter was located in the Spadja sector of the Outer Rim, a system that was very rarely traveled, and for good reason. There have been the establishment of many different Jedi temples and outposts located all over the galaxy, but this one seems purposefully tucked away. And that is not by mistake. Spinter was known as a peaceful place of seclusion. It was founded by the Jedi as a spiritual retreat for those that were losing their way basically a vacation spot for Jedi that were feeling the squeeze of the dark side closing in on them. The isolated world was chosen so that faltering Jedi could find a tranquil environment in which to reconnect with solely the light side. Originally, it was just a small outpost, and the Jedi coming there were only there to use rooms for sleeping and eating while they spent the majority of their time in the nature of the world. The Dawn Temple itself didn't come much later, when the mounting pressures of keeping peace in a slowly failing Republic brought more and more Jedi to the brink of the outpost, as many began embracing the dark side inadvertently. Therefore, the High Council constructed a brand new site in a new facility at an unknown point in history. The Dawn Temple was planned to be more than a meditative retreat, and was decidedly made also to be a rehabilitation center for those falling towards the darkness. The Dawn Temple was named for what seemed to be an inevitable return to the light side for those who were treated at the location. But now we have sensed what you all are thinking. This place sounds like an incredibly important and useful location, so why have we not heard of it? That's one of the curious aspects, and the first red flag. Hardly any Jedi actually knew about the Dawn Temple, and while it wasn't technically kept a secret, it was definitely put on the down low. Most of only the people that knew about the Dawn Temple were high-ranking masters or members of the Jedi High Council, and those that had already been treated there of course. Although the Dawn Temple was never widely known, it became quietly renowned among the upper ranks of the Jedi Order as a place of healing that could restore even the darkest spirits. To put it plainly, it was a place mostly known only to the elites of the Jedi Order. As a side note, in our opinion the decision to hoard the knowledge of a place meant to help people overcome the darkness is a very un-Jedi-like thing to do. For the longest time, it was believed that all the Jedi did to deter themselves from falling to the dark side was the use of fear tactics such as expulsion from the Jedi Order or even jail time. 
the Council of Reconciliation dealt harshly with those accused of dark side practices, so the knowledge that there was a meditative retreat that could rehabilitate those Jedi in need, but was kept mostly as a secret among the upper echelons of the Order, is very disturbing to say the least. It is if to say that only a small amount of Jedi are deserving to get the help that they need, and the rest can simply be cast out, which is what we would have said, but we found out the lie hidden within the Dawn Temple itself one of the Jedi Order's greatest mistakes. While the Dawn Temple was indeed a location for rehab of Dark Jedi, but they never spoke of how they were rehabilitated. For those that were only tempted by the dark side and needed to find their way back to the light, they would get the soothing, meditative retreat experience that the place was known for. However, those who fully fell to the dark side would get a much different experience at the Dawn Temple. They would be forcefully imprisoned, put into stasis fields where they could do no harm, and they would have their minds mess with as the rehabilitation process took its effect. It isn't entirely known exactly what would happen to them there, but it was something akin to brainwashing and using machines and the Force in order to do so. On Coruscant, most of the time, Jedi who slip up are given a second chance to prove that they will not go down the dark path again. If they do, though, they are stripped of rank and cast out. But if someone is admitted to the Dawn Temple, there is no getting out, in a stasis field that would remain until the treatment took full effect. There was no casting out or execution. There was simply imprisonment until they changed and turned back to the light, or were forcefully kept there forever. Essentially, an old mental institution in our own real world. A disturbing secret of the Jedi Order that they do not want to be let out, especially under Yoda's watch. The Dawn Temple would see a boom of admittance during the Clone Wars, as more and more Jedi were being admitted to the facility. What's interesting about the Dawn Temple is it was only run by three Jedi and three caretakers. They were known as the Curator, the Warden, and the Jailer. What's interesting, though, is they were all mostly very pleasant and simply carried on their duties without any fuss and were generally quite helpful and understanding. The curator was a Jedi who was an elderly Sarian. He appeared in simple robes, composed entirely of silvery blue light. His role was to manage the records and archives of the temple and to oversee day-to-day -day management of supplies and logistics. Although he is still a powerful and knowledgeable figure, he is the least prominent of the gatekeepers that oversaw the Dawn Temple. The Warden appears as a female Zabrak formed of golden light, wearing Jedi battle armor and has a lightsaber at her belt. Although her insubstantial form means that both the armor and the weapon are purely symbols of her role. She was made to oversee the defense of the Dawn Temple against the threats of outside forces, or even from within. The Warden is more concerned about maintaining the security of the Dawn Temple and its inhabitants than the deeper mysteries of the Force. She is grounded and practical, but still knowledgeable with her duties. The Warden knows the secrets of lightsaber construction, maintains training routines for a number of combat forms for the inhabitants, and can grant access to outer defenses of the temple to appropriate personnel. Despite her lack of personalized knowledge, the Warden has perhaps the strongest personality of any of the gatekeepers, and she reacts with the full fervor of an honor-bound warrior when her charges are threatened. And the third and final gatekeeper, you have the Jailer. Despite his intimidating name, the Jailer is the most approachable of the gatekeepers. He takes the form of a short, elderly Miraluka male composed of pure white light. The Jailer is the master intelligence of the Dawn Temple and has the most seniority of all of the gatekeepers. He was created to oversee the care and treatment of Jedi who have lost their connection to the light side and to guide them back to the serenity of the Force. As the primary overseer of the Dawn Temple, the Jailer has full control over the temple systems and can override any of the gatekeeper's commands. He was programmed with the authority to judge supplicants at the temple as being worthy or unworthy. Despite his power and knowledge, or perhaps because of them, the Jailer is mild and gentle, focused primarily on redemption and rehabilitation. When someone seeks the Jailer's aid, they must prove that they are planning to use its responsibility going forward rather than seeking a quick fix. The Jailer is the most powerful and wise of all of the gatekeepers. All in all, the Dawn Temple and its Crusaders seem to genuinely care about the rehabilitation of those who have fallen to the dark. They take their positions very seriously and are working hard to improve the life of Jedi that serve the Order. 
However, the fact that this is a hidden location, hold only by the highest ranking members of the Jedi Order, serve as a major mistake. A place behind closed doors, there is brainwashing and schemes afoot to tarnish the sanctity and reverence that should be held at the Dawn Temple. At the conclusion of the Clone Wars, when Order 66 was called, the temple was largely abandoned. Fortunately, the Dawn Temple was never discovered by the Empire, and all the while, potentially hundreds of Jedi were left in stasis, those that had fallen. However, one day, they would eventually be found, freed, and defeated by a group of adventurers sometime in the future. The fact that the Dark Jedi had been in stasis for decades, making them very weak. This does not fix the fact, though, that they were abandoned and forgotten, potentially left there for hundreds of years, much like how Dagon Locke was in Jedi Survivor. A cast aside secret of one of the major failings of the Jedi Order. What lies within and beyond the unknown regions of space? The Star Wars galaxy is an incredibly detailed world with thousands of unique planets, species, cultures, and force wielders. Characters in the mythos are pulled from every corner of the known galaxy. But while the galaxy as we know it is extremely large and complex, there is an even more daunting land beyond the Star Wars galaxy that we all know. And it is now more important than ever to understand what lies beyond thanks to the Ahsoka series, and exploring not only the Star Wars galaxy that we know, but also brand new galaxies from the mythos. The Unknown Regions is broadly defined as the uncharted space beyond the Outer Rim, and does not have any known hyperspace lanes that can be used to travel to it. Hyperspace lanes is what connects the entire galaxy itself, and since none exist in the Unknown Regions due to a mysterious barrier, traveling there is nearly impossible. Nearly. The outer edge of the Unknown Regions contains a mysterious hyperspace barrier, and little is known about what lies beyond this edge. But let's discuss what we do know, mainly from Legends. We will also be talking about the first two episodes of Ahsoka, so spoilers ahead. One quick distinction to make is that in the Ahsoka series, Magistrate Morgan Elsbeth seems to be targeting an entirely separate galaxy or star cluster. The Unknown Regions entails the space beyond the galaxy that we know, but the inclusion of an entirely new galaxy may or may not fall beyond the Unknown Regions, depending on how the show plays out. For this reason, we're going to talk about some of the most powerful forces from both the Unknown Regions and beyond in order to best cover what we might expect to see moving forward. Charting the Unknown Regions has always been difficult, but that doesn't mean that it cannot be done. Shortly after the rise of the Empire, the colonization corporation known as Anawa ventured into the Unknown Regions to find other habitable planets. They then used these planets to relocate Imperial refugees. Perhaps the most well-known body of power in the Unknown Regions was known as the Chiss Ascendancy, best known for producing the likes of Grand Admiral Thrawn. But the Chiss are far from the only civilizations in the Unknown Territories. Alongside them are the likes of the Sea Ruvi Imperium, the Vagali, the Killik Colony, and the Empire of the hand. These societies worked essentially as a galaxy of their own, with very little communication or trade with anyone in the current Star Wars galaxy that we know. They didn't fall under the jurisdiction of the Republic, the Empire, or any other governing body that destroys most of the worlds that we see in Star Wars. Let's begin with the Sea Ruvi Imperium, which was ruled by a lifelong monarch by the name of Shriftut, who demonstrated absolute control over the Imperium society. The Shreeftut, however, had to be elected by both the Council of Elders as well as the Conclave who existed in consistent struggle with one another, each wanting to elect a different official. The Shreeftut, in addition to ruling over the Shi Ruvi, was also tasked with preventing a war between the Elders and the Conclave otherwise known as the Religious Authority. While the military of this people was formidable and was among the mightiest in the Unknown Regents, the Si Ruvi deeply feared death away from their own sacred star cluster, not wanting to perish from beyond the region that they knew. For these reasons, their military was mostly defensive in nature, and if they were left alone, they tended not to seek any conflict with outside forces, and for thousands of years, they never drifted beyond their known barriers and cluster. The society of the Vagali, however, were known for being nomadic slavers and tyrants who drifted from one sector to another in search of conquest. They were perhaps most well known as the arch nemesis of the Chiss, and the two routinely did battle with one another. Grand Admiral Thrawn himself was even responsible for defeating legions of them in battle with his forces, and over the years, the Chiss became intimately aware of how the Vagali operated. After their defeat at the hands of the Chiss, however, they retreated into some of the darkest corners of the region in order to rebuild their forces, lying in wait. 
Part of this entailed creating an alliance with the Yuzhong Vong, the Vong, who were in the midst of preparing an invasion of the galaxy that we know from the Star Wars lore. The Yuzhong Vong were known by even the Chiss as far outsiders, as they originated outside the known galaxy and beyond the reach of even the Chiss ascendancy. The origin point and current whereabouts of the Vong are arguably the farthest known point at this period in the timeline. The Vong were sentient humanoids who were known for wiping out over 300 trillion life forms during their invasion of a galaxy. And it's even been theorized that Palpatine created the Empire as a unified defense force against a potential invasion from the Vong forces. If we are to measure threats beyond the known regions, then we would be hard pressed to find anything more dangerous and fearsome than the Vong as they could potentially pose the most serious threat to the galaxy. Not only are the Vong masochists who embrace the sensation of pain, but they were unable to be sensed through the Force, and were even resilient to several Force-based attacks. Only the strongest Force sensitives in the galaxy, such as those from the Skywalker bloodline, could touch the Vong with the Force. This immediately put the Jedi of this era on their heels, but they persisted nonetheless under Luke. The Vong lived in constant pain as part of their religion, grafted organs for themselves, sacrificed limbs, and became incredibly jaded and resilient warriors. Their warrior culture is perhaps the most dangerous known threat to the galaxy, beyond even the Empire or the Sith. But of course, this is open for debate and interpretation. Some of the other most well-known forces in the Unknown Regions, however, were the Killick Colony and the Empire of the Hand. The Killicks in particular were actually once native to Alderaan of the Core Worlds and existed thousands of years before the planet was ever populated by humans. Many of them were, however, taken as slaves and laborers by the race of Celestials, who spread the Killicks across the galaxy to work in mines from across the system. What's interesting to note is that at this point, even the Daughter and the Son, the two living embodiments of the life and the dark side of the Force, had colonies of Killix at their disposal to do their work, with the Daughter and the Son being descendants of the Celestials. Force travel and intergalactic conflict, they found themselves removed from the galaxy and in the unknown regions, where the remnants of them would build into the Killick colony. Some of the Killicks survived in the Unknown Regions, but this colony became one of the more unified collections of survivors from this race. The Empire of the Hand, however, was a much more recent development constructed by none other than Thrawn himself, as a shadow of the Empire to pacify his sector and rule in the Unknown Regions. Having taken notes from Lord Sidious's regime, Thrawn elected to create a unified front which would not only subjugate his immediate neighbors, but would put up a firm resistance against the Vong in the event of an invasion an invasion which ultimately did happen in Legends. In canon, we know that Grand Admiral Thrawn was exiled to the Unknown Regions just a few years before the fall of the Empire, with Ahsoka taking place roughly six to nine years later. And as we learn from the latest episode, Thrawn is not in the Unknown Regions, but a separate galaxy entirely likely building his own canonical adaptation of the Empire of the Hand, and maybe even the rise of the First Order. Now that Morgan Elsbeth is attempting to create a bridge between the two galaxies, it's important to wonder if something else besides Thrawn might come through that door once opened. And if they are not alone, then what might be joining them? Will this bridge lead to an invasion by the Vong, or will it allow some of the characters we know to explore the unknown regions and new galaxies? We will all have to wait and see. But stay tuned to the channel and the archives as we will be delving deep into the lore of the Unknown Regions in the days to come, as well as keeping you updated on everything Ahsoka. As always, my friends, may the Force be with you, and thank you for visiting the archives. The Star Wars galaxy is home to some of the most fantastical and fascinating things. Many planets and star systems each hold their own mysteries to be explored, and while most of the galaxy is mapped out on star charts, there remains one facet of the galaxy that never seems to have been explored. This, of course, is the Unknown Regions. Nearly half of the Star Wars galaxy is unexplored, leaving the other half to remain nearly untouched by the Galactic Republic and uncolonized by most other species. This is due to the constantly changing height hyperspace routes which stunt many attempts at exploration. However, opening and closing hyperlanes happen to be the least of one's worries when attempting to access unknown space. So stick with us today, curious spacefarers of the galaxy, as we lead you through the top 5 most dangerous things in the unknown regions. And hopefully by the end of this video, you too will understand the terror that lies beyond known space. Starting at number 5, we have what is known as the Summa Verminoth. 
Many of you might recognize the gargantuan creature as the beast within the Maw in Solo, a Star Wars story. Han Solo has been able to escape the beast with many tentacles by faking it out by launching the Millennium Falcon's escape pods into the Maw. Although this was a beast that had inhabited the Maelstrom and the surrounded Kessel Run, their species originated from the Unknown Regions. For those of you that don't know, they were massive creatures with many eyes and electrified tentacles that often fed on spacefaring ships due to their large size and appetite. Appetite. Their beastie bulk nearly dwarfs that of an asteroid worm seen in A New Hope with one specimen reaching the size of the first Death Star. With the one in Solo A Star Wars Story being considered relatively small for the species, because of the fact that it targeted large ships made it incredibly dangerous, and one of the most dangerous creatures that one could encounter in the unknown regions. As if one stumbled upon it so unluckily, it meant nearly certain death. At number 4 we have a dark side cult known as the Sorcerers of Rand. The Sorcerers of Rand, also known as the Randites, were a religious sect of beings which inhabited a place called the Nile Retreat. The Randites are something not often touched upon in Star Wars Legends, despite them possibly becoming a very large threat to the wider galaxy in the future, though we get a clue as to who they are from Mother Talzin's chapter in the Book of the Sith. In the book, she says this, The most enigmatic of a new competitors are the Sorcerers of Rand, the claim kinship with the Dark, which they view as the embodiment of decay and death. A true sorcerer is said to be able to use a psychic blast to eradicate an object or living being of the Force entirely. The Randites did not believe in the Force, light or dark, but actually subscribed to a power that they believed to be higher than the Force, a power which they called the Dark. This was their creed, only power is real, and only real power is the power to destroy. Existence is fleeting, destruction is eternal. For the Randites, destruction was the will of the universe. They called this the way of the dark. The way of the dark was the cornerstone of the Randites. They saw destruction as a permanent change in the structure of the universe. Through this destruction, a void was created, an absence of life. The void was the foundation of truth. They reveled in the pit of cosmic chaos, and they were able to access a wide variety of mysterious power, much like the Night Sisters of Dathomir. However, it seemed that the sorcerers might have been far more powerful. As stated by Mother Talzin, she said that she had heard that they could use their power to utterly eradicate anything in their path by using psychic energy. The psionic powers go beyond this as well, with them being able to use a power which they called Dark Sight. Dark Sight was an ability to create the future by looking at all the possible outcomes and choosing the one that suited their best use, though the outcome was not guaranteed. Part of its success was determined by the user's alignment with the dark. We learn about this when Luke Skywalker had to defend the New Republic from a prophet by the name of Lord Shadowspawn, who had studied under the Sorcerers of Rand. At number 3, we have what is known as the Star Weirds. I am not making that up. Picture this, you and your crew are flying through hyperspace on your way to exploration. A few Jedi are among you just for safety. Suddenly, from beyond your ship, you see a figure floating there in hyperspace. It is a tall and gaunt, impossibly bony figure. Its long skeletal arms, so prominent, with it holding its hands at its side tipped with three long sharp talons on each of the hands. Its hair and clothes float up around it as it flies there. Upon seeing you, its dark sockets suddenly light up as it lets out a shriek that you can hear in your very mind. Fear grips your heart as your blood runs cold. Your hands white knuckled the controls of the ship, but it's too late. These incorporeal banshees have already boarded your ship. In the back, you hear lightsabers ignite, and another shriek is let out, and then suddenly, you hear the lightsabers extinguish as the bodies of your Jedi compatriots fall to the floor and all goes quiet. What I just described was a likely encounter with a Star Weird. These creatures are believed to be manifestations of the dark side, which often encounter broken down ships in empty space and can even manifest into hyperspace. Upon being spotted, Star Weirds become enraged and release a loud, piercing, telepathic shriek that affects creatures within 20 meters. Due to the call's telepathic nature, it could be heard even in the vacuum of space. After issuing the shriek, the powerful creature would would set upon its foe, 
shredding them with their sharp, taloned claws. A star weird would only choose one target and focus in on that individual. The creatures were noted for having a particular hatred for force sensitives, who they would mindlessly concentrate on killing even if they were other creatures that were present there. These beings were capable of using the Force, and could use abilities such as Life Drain, and even Force Lightning. What is most frightening about these creatures is that they aren't confined to the unknown regions, having made appearances in Wild Space and even the Outer Rim. Number 2, we have the Zonama Sakat. Zonama Sakat is one of the most curious occurrences in the entire Star Wars galaxy, as it is a phenomenon of a sentient force-wielding planet. Zonama was the name of the planet, whereas Sakat was the name of the living intelligence. Originally, the planet was in the main part of the galaxy and was inhabited by the Nangaisi colonists. The planet was rumored to be home to one of the fastest ships, which led Anakin and Obi-Wan to explore the planet at one point in time. Later on, the planet would be attacked by the Yuzhong Vong, although Sakat repelled their attacks and ultimately defeated the Force. During an invasion of the Empire, Sakat unveiled its secret, which was a hyperdrive that the Langeshi had built into the planet itself. Sakat then activated it and escaped into the unknown regions. Later, Luke Skywalker and his companions would seek out the planet to learn more about the Yuzhong Vong. This was because Zonan was a seed that was separated from the original home planet of the Yuzhong Vong, which brings us neatly to our last stop. The planet, however, is highly interesting because, again, it represents an intelligence as well as a living planet, and it was able to defeat one of the most powerful forces in the Star Wars galaxy, not only by being more powerful, but by also outwitting them, leading us again into our number one. The number one most dangerous thing in the unknown regions of space is the Yuzhong Vong. We have briefly covered the Vong a few times before on the channel. They are without a doubt one of the biggest threats to the entirety of the Star Wars galaxy, because they don't actually originate from the Star Wars galaxy. The Vong come from another galaxy entirely, and as such, they don't adhere to the rules of the Star Wars galaxy as we know it. Many Vong warriors are resistant or outright immune to many force powers. They don't use technology, but rather use a strange technology consisting of living biots, creatures that were born and bred for their specific tasks. Their starships, weapons, gadgets, and even their armor is made from strange organic material. The Yuzhong Vaughn themselves despise technology and see it as an abomination. As such, their ship's weapons are strong enough to penetrate and even eat away at most ships, including their deflector shields, giving the Vong an inherent advantage. In Star Wars Legends, the Yuzhong Vong invasion was so impactful that it nearly completely destroyed the entire New Republic, as well as Luke Skywalker's New Jedi Academy. Notable pieces of technology included their feared Yamosks, which were called War Coordinators due to the fact that they served as biotic battle analysis computers, and have the capacity to coordinate Yuzhong Vong forces to a frightening degree. Through their villips, they had managed to create a communication system that rivaled the galactic holonet. Different breeds of such organisms were also capable of producing living light holograms which the Yuzhong Vong had mastered for centuries. Similar to navigation computers, the Yuzhong Vong vessels possessed navibrains that were required to plot hyperspace jumps. On their ships were also weapons that could manipulate gravity to pull entire ships out of hyperspace. Yuzhong Vong personal weaponry included living serpentine weapons called Ampistat that were able to alter their form, allowing their user to use them as a spear or a whip. Furthermore, they wore Vondam Skur Kinnick armor, which was capable of protecting them from weapon fire as well as even lightsaber strikes. There have been a small outpost of Yuzhong Vong in the Unknown Regions and Legends, which the Chiss ancestry have made first contact with determining that they were in fact hostile. With the Yuzhong Vong being the only creature that lies in the unknown regions of space, besides the likes of Abeloth, which is a force entity that rivaled the entirety of the Star Wars galaxy. So friends, what did you think of today's video, and would you like to learn more about the unknown regions of space? Also, out of everything that we listed, what did you find to be the most terrifying? As always my friends, if you enjoyed this video, a like would help out the channel a great deal. As always, may the force be with you, and I will hopefully see you soon.
Hey what's up guys and welcome back to the channel. A little while ago we did a video detailing the 5 most dangerous things that lie hidden within the unknown regions of space. Wild space has been a topic that has been touched on very little in Star Wars canon and even in Legends. Many things that lie within the unknown space remain a complete mystery. The unknown regions takes up nearly half of the Star Wars galaxy, which begs the question, why hasn't it been explored in the first place? Well in today's video, we hope to analyze the star charts, run some numbers in our nav computer and open some data cards in order to exactly answer why the unknown regions are exactly that, so unknown. And hopefully by the end of this video we'll have a better idea exactly why all those that travel to the unknown regions of space never seem to return, as well as why the unknown regions are so dangerous, not because of the creatures that lie within the unknown regions, but because they're so dangerous to travel in the first place. So with introductions out of the way, let us begin. As you very well know, the main method of travel between systems is known as hyperspace in the Star Wars galaxy. The entirety of the Star Wars galaxy is connected by these things known as hyperspace lanes. For those of you that may not know or may need a refresher, hyperspace, despite being called colloquially nicknamed light speed or hyperspeed, isn't simply the ships going very, very fast. If this were the case, then ships would be constantly colliding with planets, moons, nebulas, and asteroids all of the time. Hyperspace itself is basically another dimension within space that ships can enter using hyperdrives. Hyperlanes are essentially interdimensional tubes that ships can travel through. And this is essentially how hyperspace lanes are pioneered and how travel happens in the Star Wars universe. The galaxy is connected and mapped by these hyperspace lanes, like one big nervous system. Well-traveled and commonly known hyperlanes are the most consistent and always stay open. However, in places like the Deep Core and in the Unknown Regions, these hyperspace lanes have not been well-charted and are frequently subject to rapidly opening and closing, as well as simply shifting course at any given moment. This unpredictability makes hyperspace exploration into the Unknown Regions extremely dangerous. There are many theories as to why the Unknown Regions are so difficult and nigh impossible to explore. However, there is a firm reason, and not exactly a theory but more a proper explanation. This reason comes in the form of an anomaly known as the Tangle. The Western Barrier, also known as the Hyperspace Tangle or the Tangle, was a chain of hyperspace anomalies that bisected to the galaxy west of the Deep Core and prevented exploration of the unknown regions for a millennia. The Tangle formed in the middle of the circumferential hyperspace barrier that enveloped the galaxy in a shell of hyperspace turbulence. In England, English, the entire Star Wars galaxy is enveloped in a barrier that prevents entry or exit from it. And this is the reason why no one who has ever tried to leave the galaxy has ever come back. The species known as the Yuzhong Vong had found a very specific weak point in the hyperspace barrier and somehow entered the galaxy that we know through there. It was believed by the pre-Republic scientists that the barrier was put in place by the ones of Mortis in order to defend the galaxy against extragalactic threats. Despite this barrier, it seems that the borders of it are somewhat permeable and that it can actually be manipulated, as we know that there are actually some planets in the unknown regions that can and have been consistently reached. Most prominently, the planet of Ilum, which Force-sensitive navigators can usually find very easily, as well as the planet of Camino, and not to mention Corellian traders who had been in touch with the Chiss for many years. The barrier was created by the Celestials to protect against threats such as the Yuzhan Vong, the Rakatan Empire, and most notably, the entity known as Mangal Mangal. Everyone strap in as we are about to dive into something quite horrifying and the reason for the galactic barrier is about to make a lot of sense. If you want the more common answer though, it's because the hyperspace lanes are constantly in flux and constantly changing, as well as they're incredibly difficult to map out with the ship itself not being destroyed. Now though, let's talk about the Mungal Mungal. This creature was an amorphous gray slime that is believed to be extra dimensional in origin. The slime can move quickly and shape shift to look like simple creatures. It could split its body and travel separately in worm-like stakes or even grow wings in order to fly. What makes the Mungal Mungal so deadly though is what it could do to living organism. The slime would attack its victims and enter the body, whether through the nose, mouth, or even pores if necessary. After which, it would proceed to feast on the organism from the inside, 
first digesting their brain and then the rest of its organs, leaving the victim a brittle husk. From here, it can completely dominate their body and use it to move around with enough dexterity and precision to even pilot a ship if necessary. When the body that was currently hosting it rots to the point of uselessness, it will find another host to inhabit, springing towards their new victim's face out of the services of the previous one. The more biological mass it consumed, the Mangal Mangal would grow in size all the while. Its intention to spread itself across the galaxy until it completely dominates every plant, animal, and being. As it is worth mentioning that every separated part of the Mongal Mongol shares one single hive mind and spreads very, very quickly and easily. At a long forgotten point in the past, it had taken over and rendered lifeless the planet of Mogfalo. Eons later, Mongal Mongal had spread across to the planet, even filling all of its former oceans and destroying all of its natural beauty to the point that all that remained visible of the former world were barren continents and the remains of fossilized trees. Its body ran so far and deep across the planet that it ran in rivers across the continents and filled underground grottoes. As a testament to its depraved mind, Mungal Mungal created a macabre decoration of a fleet of derelict ships forming a ring around the planet, their origins ranging from across millennia and thousands upon thousands of years. This was simply its decorations. It used its mind-controlled zombies to pilot the ships there. Over the course of its existence, Mungal Mungal staked its claim to thousands upon thousands of worlds, moons, and space stations, all throughout the unknown regions, and those from separate galaxies that had traveled there. For those of you who have read the Death Troopers novel, it was found that the properties of Mungal Mungal shared heavy similarities to the virus found on Project Blackwing. The slime was in fact very intelligent, and maybe even had a connection to the dark side as Mungal Mungal delighted in torturing and consuming other beings. The creature actually seemed to thrive more on a being's suffering than on the sustenance that their bodies provided to it. Using its possession abilities, it would create torturous scenarios such as reuniting a grieving mother with the reanimated corpse of their youngling time and time again in order to create the most terrifying visions possible. In order to essentially make their prey more delicious, it would persuade other beings by playing with their emotions, persuading them into making deadly decisions such as opening a ship's airlock or deactivating perimeter fences. Anyone who spoke to it would find that it knew much of the ancient knowledge and could speak many ancient languages long forgotten. The creature knew of events such as the dawn of the Jedi Order and told tales of the Ones as well as the Rakatan Empire, tales from the very beginning of Star Wars lore. In my humble opinion, I would say that this being rivaled the threat level of Abeloth herself and perhaps it is for the best that the unknown regions remained unexplored. I also believe that it is a major gift and a major reason why the ones of Mortis may have made the unknown regions so unexplorable and so dangerous to begin with, with the Mungal Mungal being among the greatest threats ever in the Star Wars mythos. So friends, what did you think of this video, and do you hope to get more information about the unknown regions as Star Wars canon continues to unfold? And what are your thoughts on the deadliness of Mungal? Mungal Mungal. Drop a comment down below on what type of video and what aspect of Star Wars lore you would like to see explored next. And throughout the Star Wars mythos, we are treated to truly fantastical ideas and beings from across the galaxy, both equally wondrous and terrifying in nature. We know of the benevolent and helpful Jedi Force Ghosts, an ability discovered by Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn to transcend death and become one with the Force itself. Through sorcery and magic, a select few Sith have also been able to find their own way around death, as well as freeing their own evil spirits to continue their reign of terror. One of these Sith Lords being freed in Nad, whose tomb caused several great wars and the fall of Exar Kun to the dark side. But what if I told you that these spirits weren't the only ghosts of Star Wars lore? I'm sure you remember our video of the top 5 Sith powers and remember the phantoms that Darth Vectivus knew had to summon. However, today we are speaking of spirits that can only be found in the deepest reaches of space. Not a mere smuggler's tale either, a very real threat that any spacefarer should be very cautious of. Welcome, curious travelers of the galaxy, to today's video, where we will be giving you an essential guide to surviving an encounter with the Star Weirds. Of all of the Lovecraftian horrors in Star Wars, 
Star Weirds post one of the most significant threats, at least with Abeloth. We know that she is trapped and will only ever escape every other millennia. However, we find no such solace with the Star Weirds. Equating very similar to our world's Banshee folklore, these malevolent spirits haunt deep space and have been known to attack ships in or out of hyperspace. Sailors who have survived have described the Star Weirds as humanoid, impossibly tall, and severely gaunt and skeletal. They have wispy white hair that floats upward and ripped rags of clothes that drift behind them. They have long arms that end up with three sharp black talons. As horrible as this is, it only gets worse. Their faces have been described as having a wide mouth with jagged, rotting teeth and shiny eyes that which glow through the darkness of space itself. Though I highly recommend keeping your eyes to yourself for your own sake, as according to some accounts, if you look into the face of a star weird, you might see your own face staring back at you. But not in your normal state, rather your own face, decayed and rotten. Should these sinister specters board your ship, here's what you should expect. Firstly, I don't recommend trying to shoot or hit them with anything. Their bodies are incorporeal. No blunt force trauma will phase them at all, or any physical attack for that matter. You may not be able to hurt them physically, but they can certainly hurt you. With their long talons, they can attack and scratch at their prey. If you are frightened by this, I regretfully inform you that there is still more terror to come. Earlier, I compared them to our world's banshees. Reason being is that nothing traumatizes the sailors more than the Star Weird's haunting wail, a wail that can be heard even from the vacuum of space. These hyperspace terrors will enter your mind and torment you to insanity by telepathically screaming into your head. Is there any way to avoid them or get rid of them though? Well, the answer isn't exactly simple nor straightforward. First thing is first, avoid deep space at all costs. This is the easiest way to ensure your safety when concerning the Star Weirds. Secondly, if you must go through deep space, make sure of a couple of things. One, that you have thoroughly inspected your ship to make sure that everything is working in order and there is no chance that you will break down in the middle of space. And two, be sure that neither you nor any aboard your vessel is a Jedi or can touch the Force. This is very, very important. Yes, friends, the Star Weirds will dine on anything they come across. However, they seem to specifically hunt for Force Wielders. Jedi or Sith alike, it doesn't matter to them but they seem to just utterly despise the Jedi. It is said that if a Force user is present, that the Star Weird will hyper-focus on killing them, even if there are a plentiful amount of other living beings present. Perhaps it is the light side of the Force that draws them so close, as this seems to be the only thing that can actually harm them, the only thing that threatens them. Jedi using the light side can repel or kill the Star Weirds, because as we said, they are beings of the Force. Specifically, it is rumored that a Star Weird is constructed purely out of dark side energy. It is essentially the living dark side, as the dark side swirling in unknown space has presumably created this monstrosity. Many Jedi speculate that the Star Weirds are manifestations of the dark side or spirits of the Sith that never made it to the afterlife, but no one can know for certain. What we do know is that they can certainly use the dark side and themselves are force sensitive manifesting force powers such as life drain, force grip, and even in rare occurrences, force lightning. The third and final tip that we have for you is if all else fails, do not look at the Star Weirds. Star Weirds will manifest themselves to sailors having to repair their ship in space or on ships in hyperspace, but if you know one is near, do not look at it, even if they attempt to trick you with visions. Do not stop to help stranded ships in space, for their fate is sealed. When looked upon, this is when they become enraged, unleashing their horrible shriek and begin to attack. It is important to remember the distinction between the Star Weirds and the Space Wraiths. Space Wraiths are a Force-sensitive parasite species which use their telepathy to dominate and feed off of the mind of Force-sensitives. Space Wraiths have no corporeal body to speak of as they exist in mere thought. If their host is killed while the Space Wraith is possessing them, the Wraith itself will die as well. Star Weirds, on the other hand, do not possess their prey and can only be destroyed with the Force. When they die, they disappear and leave no trace of themselves behind. Very little is known in regard to their history. According to Master Wellet's Codex files, they can be found in Star Wars The Old Republic. During the first war fought between the reconstructed Sith Empire and the Galactic Republic, the Star Weird Queen was a member of the Space 
species that attacked many members of the Jedi Council, and even a Padawan named Zerender. This group, fortunately, was saved by Master Wyalette. After this happened, Master Wyalette was captured by the Sith Empire. It is not known what happened to the Starward Queen, however but we do know that she was not killed. And this is the only recorded event of the Star Weird Queen presenting herself to anybody. But just for a moment, I would like to talk about the implications of the existence of such a creature and a queen of the Star Weirds. If the Star Weirds have a queen, then they may operate on some sort of spiritual hierarchy. The Star Weird Queen was regarded as a legendary being, again with only one confirmed appearance of her. Other than this, she exists purely in legends, but it is important to note that she did in fact side with the Sith purely against the Jedi. In terms of power, the Star Weird Queen may lie somewhere between such as figures like Darth Sidious and maybe even the ones of Mortis as a force-based entity, a being potentially older than the ones of Mortis older than Abeloth, she could possibly hold immense power. Immense power from a region unknown to even those that have traveled deep into unknown space. It is clear that she is ancient and has existed presumably before any known event in Star Wars mythos. No other appearances of the Queen have ever been recorded in history since that fateful day. But anyway, Acolytes, what did you think of today's story? And do you think that it would be interesting to have a peek in on the spiritual battle of the Jedi's Force Ghosts and the Star Wars? or maybe even some Sith spirit. Do you think that Star Weirds will ever make an appearance in Star Wars canon? If so, comment below your thoughts. And now, my wary spacefarers, be warned and beware of the dangers that lie out within deep space. Normally, I would say, may the Force be with you, but when concerning the Star Weirds, that might spell your certain doom. The Ahsoka trailer is finally here, and in it, we got to see many cameos from the heroes whose story never got to be finished, with the crew of the Ghost finally returning. And yet again, they're facing off against one of the greatest threats that the galaxy has ever seen, and the Mandoverse has been building up to, and that is of course, Grand Admiral Thrawn. Greetings, once again, Acolytes of the Galaxy, and welcome back to the Archives. The name Thrawn sends chills down the spine of anyone familiar with the Star Wars EU, and in recent years, this terrifying admiral has taken his rightful place in canon. Thrawn is someone who makes the Empire scary again. Our idea of intimidating Imperial leaders usually comes in the form of the two reigning Sith Lords that occupy the higher facets of the Empire, but Thrawn is different. Other leaders in the chain of command usually come in the form of Grand Moffs and governors like Tarkin. Tage, and Krennic, leaders who normally sit around a table and bicker with one another. However, Thrawn is the man who is hands-on, the one that makes the Imperial Navy something that is not only formidable, but nearly indomitable. But with Thrawn's return now at hand thanks to the Ahsoka series, what can we expect from this powerful warlord? What does Thrawn actually want? And can Legends continuity once again be our navigator? Or are we flying blind? Today, students of the Force and Acolytes of the Galaxy, we will be exploring what makes Grand Admiral Thrawn so dangerous that he can compete with the might of Sith. There is something very helpful that is happening with the Thrawn story playing out before us, and that is Timothy Zahn. The writer of all of the Thrawn Legends novels has been brought back for his canon iteration, and has written all of the canon books as well. Because of this, Thrawn is just as purely dangerous in canon as he was in Legends. But what this also means is that the canon timeline of Thrawn's story has actually been closely followed, and much of the Legends iteration of Thrawn now belongs to canon as well. Thrawn begins his journey as a man in the Chiss Ascendancy, loyal to his people and ready to do whatever is necessary to ensure their protection and survival. However, he is somewhat coldly extremist in his views and what he is willing to do in order to protect the people that he loves. Thrawn is willing to do things that normal Chiss will not do for moral reasons. Part of the Chiss's creed is a strict aversion to attacking without it being absolutely necessary. They would much rather be reactive than provoke a war, no matter how dangerous the building threat is. However, it was Thrawn who challenged this idea, and decided to move forward with a preemptive strike against their enemies. In canon, this was a warring group known as the Gris Hemorrhagy, but in Legends, this was the Yuzhong Vong, which the Chiss referred to as the Far Outsiders. Thrawn was a controversial figure among his race, as he defied the rules of not attacking without being provoked first. This won Thrawn many victories in naval combat, but earned him a poor reputation among his people, despite all of the wins. This didn't seem to bother Thrawn so much though, as he was more concerned about the safety of his people than abiding by the rules that would lead to their extinction. After all, his homeworld of Kasala was not a part of the Republic, as it was in the unknown regions of space. And if the Chiss didn't defend themselves properly, there was no 
no one else that was going to come to their aid. But for Thrawn, everything would change during a fateful meeting with Chancellor Palpatine during the Clone Wars, a meeting in which both agreed on the coming threat that was the Yuuzhan Vong. However, the Vong weren't entirely aware of the Galactic Republic just yet, and both Thrawn and Palpatine wanted to keep it that way for as long as possible, or at least until the Galactic Empire was built and they could mount a proper military defense. However, the biggest wrench in their plans was the Outbound Flight, a project organized by the Republic to send a team of researchers and Jedi to investigate what lay beyond the unknown regions of space. What this would have done was to make the Vong aware of their presence and perhaps provoke them into attacking the Republic and known space much sooner. Teaming up with the Chancellor, Thrawn thwarted the outbound flight, ensuring its total destruction. But this was the final straw for the Chiss Ascendancy, who had had enough of Thrawn's continued preeminent strikes, and they exiled him to a distant world on the fringes of Chiss society. He would later be discovered by the Galactic Empire sometime after their rise and brought before Darth Sidious directly. The Emperor remembered Thrawn's brilliance in the destruction of outbound flight, and he was instated into the Imperial Navy. It was here where Thrawn understood his mission and grew an Imperial command, knowing that he would be the single best possible defense against the Vong. This was his main goal in Legends, to protect the wider galaxy from the extragalactic invaders that were coming. As the clock was ticking at their imminent arrival, Thrawn was then sent back into the Unknown Regions in order to build up the naval defense. But while he was gone, something very important happened. The Empire was all but destroyed in the Battle of Endor. Enraged by the Empire's destruction at the hands of the Rebellion, Thrawn patiently waited and built up his fleet of Imperial Remnants before returning to attack the New Republic doing so in the year 8 ABY. Exactly five years after the Battle of Endor, you see, it was his idea that the Empire was the best possible answer to the growing threat of the Vong. He believed that it was the only force that could protect the galaxy from utter annihilation. So when the New Republic suddenly showed up and toppled the Empire, this ruined everything and caused Thrawn to fear for the worst. In response, he went on a warpath and cut through the New Republic, securing victory after victory and nearly bringing the entire governing system to its knees. In canon, it's only slightly different. Rather than meet Palpatine during the Clone Wars, the young Thrawn would actually meet Anakin Skywalker, and the two of them together would stop the Grisk hemorrhagy and prevent disaster from reaching the Chiss people. However, the Chiss leaders would be compromised by telepathic invaders who corrupted the minds of the Chiss High Command and caused a civil war of Thrawn's people. This would be what caused Thrawn to get exiled and then be found by the Empire once again. Thrawn was then brought before Sidious, and he offered his aid to the Empire, knowing that it would be of help to his people. Sidious was impressed with his genius and his loyalty, and had him put in the Imperial Naval Academy, instantly granting him the rank of Lieutenant. Thrawn would climb the chain of command until being awarded the rank of Grand Admiral by Palpatine himself. Thrawn would work closely with Darth Vader on a few occasions, and just by observing how the Sith Lord conducted himself in battle, he would deduce his identity as Anakin Skywalker. However, Thrawn would wisely keep this knowledge to himself, and as a result, Vader worked very well with him as they saw eye to eye on many things. Many things, but not all things. We know the canon story of Thrawn from here. He would go on to take on the challenge of crushing the rebel insurgency on Lothal, which would put him against the Ghost crew and Ezra Bridger. But now that he is back, which is unsurprising considering how familiar Thrawn should be with unknown space, considering the fact that he grew up there. Using Legends as a template, it seems Thrawn has returned to not only avenge the Empire, but possibly to act on the Emperor's contingency plan, resulting in the creation of the First Order. I wouldn't be surprised at all if the birth of the First Order all starts here with Grand Admiral Thrawn, and we could learn how they grew to power in the sequel trilogy. Thrawn himself is an absolute powerhouse of a being, not in physical strength or force power, though we've seen him demonstrate above human fighting capabilities. His true danger is in his massive intellect. His intellect is an absolute trump card in the Star Wars lore, not a super weapon or a massive amount of force power, but superior strategy. Thrawn is the war tactician like Kenobi is the master of Sarisu. Thrawn wields his fleet how Sidious wields force lightning. By himself, Thrawn was able to take down an entire squadron of stormtroopers in order to secure his escape from exile with nothing but rocks, rope, traps, and stolen gear. With only one ship, 
his flagship by the name of the Chimera. He was able to outmaneuver and destroy a New Republic defense force and escape an entire fleet. Just by observing the art of a particular planet or culture, he could decipher exactly how they thought and how their minds and emotions functioned. Using this knowledge, he could craft his battle plans to perfectly suit the opponent he was facing, and in some cases, he never even had to fire a single shot by simply the position of his fleet and putting it in the right way in order to transmit a message to the system that would then surrender. In this way, Thrawn secured victory hand over fist against the New Republic in Legends. In Legends, this was all aided by his Dark Jedi puppet in Joris Sabayoth. And now, there is not only a single Dark Jedi in canon, but two. Perhaps a master and an apprentice, and maybe Thrawn will be using them for his grand plan, like how he used Joris in Legends. The bottom line is though, Grand Admiral Thrawn is likely the most dangerous man alive in the galaxy right now, and we are about to see his plan unfold. But anyway, my friends and acolytes, what are your thoughts on this brief catch-up of the origins and great power of Grand Admiral Thrawn? Are you excited to see him in the upcoming Ahsoka series? And what do you think his grand plan consists of? As always, my friends, thank you so much for visiting our archives. May the Force be with you, and have a great day. The Death Star, the primary weapon of the Empire, and their ultimate prize as they entered the Age of Galactic Domination. The Sith had finally won the generations-long war between the light side counterparts, and this was the trophy that they built to prove it. It is unknown for how long this weapon was a part of the Grand Plan, but it can be inferred that a few sources from Palpatine had been planning the construction of the superweapon for most of his life. It was his crown jewel in many respects. Each Sith Lord had their own ideas as to how the ultimate demise of the Jedi would come about. Darth Tenebris assumed that he would create a technology that would render the Force itself obsolete in the hands of a Jedi. Plagueis planned to become so powerful that his influence over life itself that he would be unchallenged by any other Force wielder. Sidious, though, had a different plan, one far more effective that he would conceive with his master before usurping him and carrying out their plan himself. Curiously though, the Death Star itself was an end and not a means. The means of destroying the Jedi was Order 66, all to establish the Empire and construct the Death Star to begin with. But why? With an overwhelming military force, Palpatine had his hold on the galaxy, but he was hellbent on making sure that the Death Star still came about. Why was he so obsessed with it? And could he have actually been trying to protect the Star Wars galaxy? Well, acolytes, welcome back to the archives and strap yourselves in as we take a deep look into a theory of not only why the Death Star was so important to Sidious, but to all of the Sith. Sidious had the plans of the Death Star from the very beginning. We know that the Death Star was something he conceived of at some point in the early days before the Clone War. As in Attack of the Clones, we see Dooku with a holographic display of the Death Star blueprint right before his escape from Geonosis. One might say that Palpatine wanted to make sure that he had the galaxy at gunpoint, but he had already done that. The Death Star wasn't a response to the rising rebel threat. He had begun construction almost immediately after the Empire had been formed, and no rebels were to be found. We know this because at the very end of Revenge of the Sith, a newly suited Lord Vader joins a newly robed Emperor and Grand Moff Tarkin aboard a Star Destroyer, looking out of the viewport at the early construction of the Death Star's hull. It is clear that Palpatine didn't need the Death Star to have control of the galaxy. He had a massive, highly advanced clone army at his disposal, a clone army that he would do away with, in part to fund the Death Star itself so that he could invest more into his dream project. Grand Admiral Thrawn was of the opinion that the Death Star was a needless waste of Imperial resources and a useless endeavor against the Rebel Alliance. It was of Thrawn's opinion that a mobile task force of stormtroopers or other special forces of Imperial troops would be far more effective at crushing the Rebellion as they would be mobile enough to keep up with the Rebels who were masters at evasive hit and run techniques. Thrawn wanted to use guerrilla warfare to fight against guerrilla warfare. We know that Palpatine highly valued Thrawn's insights and opinions. Ever since Thrawn was brought before him, the Emperor was extremely invested in his career, despite the Emperor's prejudice against alien races. The Emperor endorsed Thrawn at every single turn, having him promoted to lieutenant while he was still in the Imperial Academy. The Grand Admiral gave many important insights into the Empire and was even respected by Lord Vader. However, Palpatine would quickly dismiss his advice and continue with the project of the Death Star. So why is this? The answer is better than you may think. The Yuzhong Vong. 
For those of you who have not read the extended universe novels, the Yuzhong Vong are a warrior race that arrives from a galaxy far outside the one that we know in Star Wars. They invade the galaxy whenever the New Republic has been established, and Luke has began training his own children in the ways of the Force. The Vong nearly destroyed the New Republic and were responsible for the deaths of nearly 300 trillion beings during their invasion. A typical Vong resembled a human in form, though they were taller and heavier than the average human and had less hair on their heads. They were religious zealots who viewed mechanical technology as blasphemy. Their technological innovations were genetically engineered and purely organic. All Yuzhong Vong technology, whether it be starships, weapons, or simple everyday objects, were entirely biological. They hated droids, machines, electronics, and anything manufactured. This biotechnology was coaxed into growth by the Shapers and seemed to be more resilient when compared to conventional technology and weapons. The Vong's weaponry, including living serpentine weapons called amphistaffs that were able to alter their form, allowing the user to use them as a spear or a whip. Next, their armor, which was capable of protecting them from weapon fire and even well-placed lightsaber blows. Their large, coral-shaped craft made use of plasma weapons that ate through the hull of enemy ships, while shielding was provided by the gravity manipulation. Their ships were nearly impenetrable. Shields generated singularities that were used to protect the craft from enemy weapon fire, and were capable of stripping the shields of enemy vessels. Their weapons were even strong enough to melt Mandalorian armor, or Beskar. This was when they first made contact with the Mandalorians, sometime before Exar Klun's rise to power when they first arrived to the known universe. But things only get worse, as they were extremely deadly against Jedi, as they could not be sensed through the Force. This confounded the Jedi who first encountered the Vong. However, they were susceptible to some Force-based attacks. They are a powerful warrior race and a force to be reckoned with. In the expanded universe, they would be responsible for the death of even Chewbacca. To put it simply, the Vong were no joke, and the Sith might have known about them. We believe that in Legends, a Sith Lord had a vision or even encountered the Vong and knew they were going to invade the known galaxy, which is why the Sith had been trying so hard to defeat the Jedi and take over, not just for power's sake, but because they believe they are the only ones who can defend the galaxy from this greater evil. The Sith believed that only the dark side was powerful enough to stop these far outsiders from destroying all those lives, a galaxy left in ruin. This now answers why they only seek powerful apprentices and only respect those of which who are the strongest. This would add a deep layer of relatability and understanding of the Sith. It is harder to imagine why someone would not only want power for power's sake. Contrary to popular belief, the Sith want to protect the galaxy as much as the Jedi do. They just believe that the Jedi are far too weak and ignorant, and that the galaxy is the Sith to rule by birthright. We know thanks to legend sources that Palpatine knew of the Yuzhong Vong before the Clone Wars, as well as Thrawn. This is explored in the Thrawn novel, The Outbound Flight, and it is known that by 27 BBY, at the start of the Outbound Flight project, Palpatine had somehow gained knowledge of the incoming Yuzhong Vong fleet though he planned to withhold it from the Republic until after his new order and empire could be instituted. At least one of Palpatine's advisors, Kinmon Doriana, was informed, however, that the distant threat of invasion was also part of the reason why Palpatine ordered the destruction of outbound flight, in order to prevent its occupants from falling into the hands of the Yuzhong Vong. But things get worse. After the end of the Clone Wars, Palpatine even hints to the wider public about an incoming invasion, stating that this was one of the main reasons why he needed to keep the Imperial Navy active even after the Clone Wars ended, in order to ward off this threat of invasion. This now brings things full circle. We believe Emperor Palpatine and Legends created the Death Star as a way to counter this powerful invasion force. What better way to combat that foreign technology than with a giant superweapon of technological unprecedents? The Kryptonite to the Vong. Planet destruction was not the Death Star's intended purpose, but more of a byproduct of how powerful it needed to be. The Sith always had an affinity for superweapons, starting with Revan Starforge and the Mass Shadow Generator, and moving on to the Dark Reaper, which was being pursued by Darth Malgus. While yes, there were powerful dark side rituals such as the Thought Bomb, perhaps Palpatine wanted to use technology that would be much more reliable and more controlled, especially since the Vong were force-resistant. 
So anyway, my friends and acolytes, what are your thoughts on this? And do you believe that Palpatine constructed the Death Star to protect the Star Wars galaxy? As Sidious once said, he does not wish to rule over a galaxy of the dead. At ease, officers, and welcome back to the Imperial Academy. Grand Admiral Thrawn was the finest war tactician that ever graced the ranks of the Empire. In both legends and canon, his presence indicated a certain defeat in almost every scenario thinkable against his enemies. In the Heir to the Empire Legend series, his dealings against the New Republic almost brought them to their knees after only having been around for around four years. In canon, it took the Force itself to intercept in order to get Thrawn out of the picture before the beginning of the Galactic Civil War. Thrawn's absence during the time of the Rebellion is definitely felt, as the Empire suffers multiple defeats and had a very difficult time nailing down the Rebel Alliance during the entirety of the war. There were many shortcomings and problematic decisions made by the Imperial High Command that all could have been avoided had Thrawn been there. Furthermore, we would go as far as to say that the Alliance would have stood absolutely zero chance at all had Thrawn been involved in the Civil War. I myself even highly doubt that Darth Vader would have had to be as involved as he was if Thrawn was there to take care of the Rebels. Our top researchers have uncovered some unique data files that give us a peek into Thrawn's strategies, and we have acquired a few notes on how the esteemed Grand Admiral would have dealt with the Rebels. In this video, we will be talking about such strategies, and proving that it might have been unlikely that the Rebellion ever made it as far as destroying the Death Star and Zero ABY, had Thrawn been around. Before we begin though, we have noticed that a few ensigns have not yet enrolled into our data briefing program. So if you like what we do here on the channel, and want to continue getting updates on all of our videos, be sure to blast that subscribe button. Now, be sure to inspect your uniforms, because we are now commencing. When the Mon Calamari joined the Rebel Alliance, they brought with them a fleet of retrofitted transport freighters to act as battle cruisers. This gave the Alliance a distinct edge, as they were then able to act as a formal military now that they had a proper navy. Admiral Akbar was the leader of said navy, and worked closely with Mon Mothma and the rest of the Alliance leaders to deal fatal blows against the Empire in a quick hit-and-run raid which is a process that they then continued. One of the few times the Rebel Alliance entered a full head-to-head -head naval confrontation with the Empire was at the Battle of Endor, when the Mon Calamari cruisers engaged the Imperial fleet at the second Death Star. Other than this though, it was a very rare occurrence that the Alliance ever engaged the Imperial fleet unless they knew of certain victory. There were only so many of these Mon Calamari cruisers, and they couldn't risk losing hardly one of them. Of course, we do know of the fact that the Rebels also managed to find at least a couple of old Separatist dreadnoughts that they managed to get staffed. The primary source of their navy though was from Admiral Akbar. This is why we don't see a lot of traditional naval warfare in the Galactic Civil War like we do during the Clone Wars. The reason we bring this up is because because we believe that this would have been the exact thing that Grand Admiral Thrawn would have exploited. In almost every other naval engagement, Thrawn immediately had the upper hand due to how he would analyze his enemy and pick out their tactics and weaknesses almost on the spot. In some cases, he would be able to tell simply by the formation that they had their ships in. He did this by studying the specific art of the culture that he was fighting against. Thrawn had a distinct interest in art, and among all of his other skills, he was particularly adept at learning almost everything he needed to know about a people group just by their culture's art pieces. By doing this, Thrawn managed to pinpoint their kinds of strategies, and any shortcomings by analyzing the mind of the culture's artists, as then he would know the minds of their warriors. As we've learned, Imperial Intelligence was fully aware that the Mon Calamari were responsible for providing the rebellion ship. So Thrawn would very likely begin at once to study the art of the Mon Calamari people, as well as some data logs of previous engagements with Admiral Akbar himself. By doing this, Thrawn would definitely figure out the exact weaknesses that plagued most of Akbar's strategies. For one, he would know that Akbar was itching for a good head-to-head -head fight in which he would be able to decimate some Imperials. However, Akbar has to play it safe and use evasive tactics to stay ahead of the Empire so that they would not lose any of their valuable ships. Thrawn would possibly play into this exact thing, and either bait Akbar or trap them in a head-in-head -head engagement which he would most certainly lose. By forcing the Alliance fleet into a direct confrontation, Thrawn immediately snatches any and every advantage that they have. While Thrawn definitely has them in the cruiser category, what about the starfighter category? We plan on making a video talking about the Imperial Navy's greatest weakness, and the fact that it was their starfighter department because they insisted on cutting costs on both the TIE fighter as well as with their pilots. If Thrawn were allowed full control, this would not be a problem. 
For one, Thrawn would make sure to design the pilot training program himself, and be sure to hand-select pilots that had seen more action, since that was an advantage that the Rebels had over the Imperials. The X-Wing pilots just tended to last longer, so what they lacked in formal training they made up for in experience while fighting with the rookie TIE pilots. Having none of this, Thrawn would make sure to take care of this problem as well, as well as the issue with the TIE starfighters in general. Thrawn had once designed and submitted the perfect starfighter, the TIE Defender. The Defender literally countered all of the traditional problems of the TIE Fighter, as it had deflector shields and a hyperdrive, while still retaining the advantage of being fast and maneuverable. Darth Vader himself was actually impressed with the Defender prototypes, and they had his approval. The only problem was, it costed a lot more than the standard TIE Fighter did, so it was thrown by the wayside. The reason the TIE Defender matters so much is because of the next point we're about to make. Thrawn did actually have a plan in place that would have utterly destroyed the Rebels, and we know about it. Thrawn's ultimate strategy in crushing the Rebellion was simply to use the Empire's superior resources to beat them at their very own game. The Rebels' greatest asset and their bread and butter was their ability to move around quickly. They had several bases that they could switch between on remote systems, as they could get up and move at a moment's notice, constantly evading the Empire at every single turn. This was the main problem that the Empire had in both A New Hope as well as The Empire Strikes Back. They had a hard time locating the Rebels' hidden bases. Second, any time they would find it, the Rebels were two steps ahead and always managed to get away because they traveled extremely light. Our esteemed Grand Admiral would not have such issues because of his simple solution create a small, elite Imperial strike team that can keep pace with the Rebels. We have seen time and time again that the Rebellion can't hold their ground for very long against a direct Imperial assault. The Battle of Hoth was less of a battle and more of a massacre in some regards. Thrawn knew the Rebellion's tactics well, and had suggested that an elite task force be formed to use the Empire's superior training, equipment, and resources to act as hunter-killers. This would have made the Galactic Civil War much more like a Terminator story. This elite squad would have extended into the Starfighter Corps as well, which is why we had brought up the TIE Defender. Regular TIE Fighters could engage X-Wings in a dogfight just fine, but X-Wings had the advantage of a hyperdrive to make their attack and then quickly escape from the TIEs. However, the TIE Defender now also had a hyperdrive and could just follow them right on the heels of the Rebels. Back in the early days of the Rebellion, X-Wings were all only equipped with one set of Proton Torpedoes due to the lack of resources that they had. So whenever they spent their torpedoes, most pilots just went ahead and made the jump out to light speed. Mission accomplished. However, if the Empire were to follow them and re-engage the X-Wings after that they had spent all of their resources, it would be over. These things just go to show that Grand Admiral Thrawn, had he been around, would have won the war effortlessly on behalf of the Empire and that the Imperial Navy especially wouldn't have stood a chance. The New Republic barely stood a chance even with all of their newfound resources. But my comrades, what do you think about our research? Do you believe in the near infallibility of Thrawn? Let us know your notes in the comments down below. And until next time, may the Force be with you, and you are all dismissed.